Okay, so that, that was relatively simple. Within a few minutes, we had a nice conversation with QuickBooks. So what does the XML behind that look like? So if I were to call the query objects to XML string method, I would get back the XML that I actually sent to QuickBooks. And we see there a lot of details that QBFC took care of. It created that XML prolog for me, XML version equals 1.0. It specified what X, uh, QBXML version I wanted to speak with QuickBooks, and in this case, version equals 3.0. Then I get the QBXML and QBXML messages request envelopes. And you can kind of see here why there were all those levels that we had to walk down within QBFC. The response is that top level QBXML object, uh, uh, response, uh, envelope. And the next level, the actual response, is that QBXML messages request envelope. From there, we get to the actual customer query response, and we walk through it. And finally, it also took care of that request ID so that we can clearly distinguish, and QBFC can actually handle some of this, so that it can clearly associate each individual request that was sent. This is great for uh, error recovery as well. To show you the, request, uh, the response XML from this would be far too long. Uh, with 47 customers returned, we'd have a huge XML document. So now let's get into some of the gory details and some of the concepts behind QBXML in a little bit greater depth. First of all, some basic vocabulary. The, what we call a QBXML element is simply data that's bounded by the leading start and end tag. If you know even a little bit about XML, you can handle QBXML. So our tags are case sensitive. In this case, I have an example of the name of Robin Q public, and then the end name tag. Tags with no value can be used to clear a field in a modify request. And there are two ways of doing that in XML syntax. I can specify the beginning tag and the end tag with nothing in between. Or I can specify a beginning and end tag that's one tag, at or for, with that slash at the end. Above elements, we have aggregates. And an aggregate is a collection of elements or other aggregates. It doesn't contain any data itself. It simply contains elements that contain data. And of course, it can contain aggregates recursively. A very simple aggregate that you'll come across commonly is the bill address aggregate, which contains the adder 1, adder 2, through 4 uh, elements, the city, state, postal code, and country elements. Very straightforward, but that's an aggregate. Then we have a special kind of aggregate, which we call the reference aggregate. This is an aggregate that's used to reference one type of QuickBooks record within another record, which needs that information. You'll see this very frequently in, in transaction ad requests when you need to reference a customer or a vendor or an employee, etc. So here's a customer ref aggregate, and it actually has both a full name or a list ID that you can provide. So we see here the customer ref with the full name of Robin Q Public. That's good enough because QuickBooks requires full names to be unique within the customer list, the vendor list, etc. Or we can provide the list ID. This is probably the most reliable way to access a customer. So if you know the list ID, if you have a way of storing it in your application when you add a customer and get back the list ID, then that's a good idea to do so. So here's our list ID for a particular customer, and that's another way that we can reference that customer. We see the use of reference aggregates all over the place in a typical transaction. So here's an invoice form from QuickBooks, and we see all the references that are there. There's the customer ref, what customer am I going to send this invoice to? There's the terms ref, in this case net 30. There are sales tax code refs for each item line. There's an item ref for each item line. There's a customer message ref, sales tax ref, item sales tax ref, and so on and so forth. You'll see those in the on-screen reference for any invoice, ad request, or actually most transaction ads. The basics of QBXML are pretty straightforward. QuickBooks processes only well-formed requests. And the order of elements is important. XML does allow for non-ordered 
elements within the, an XML document. But when we need to parse an unordered XML document, the parser slows down significantly. So by turning on ordering, we improve the performance of the parsing of XML. So we do require that elements be in order. If this is a problem, QBFC is probably a good choice because then you can put your values in in any order you like and QBFC handles the, well, the proper ordering of elements in QBXML that it sends. There's one response document for the whole message set and that's why even in QBFC we see that response list. And then there's a separate response status for each request in a message set that you send and then there's a response status for the overall message set. There are several request types. There's the query, and you can filter queries or just do an unfiltered query. If you're going to do an unfiltered query, you need to be very careful because some lists and even some number of transactions within QuickBooks can be quite large. And if you ask QuickBooks to return every customer it knows about or every invoice it has ever known about, you get back an enormous XML document. And that can be a memory problem for your system as QuickBooks builds a gigantic string and sends it over COM to your application. If you're not querying, you're adding, modifying, deleting, or voiding transactions or, item, or, or lists. The object types are very straightforward. There are list objects, customers, employees, items, and so forth. And there are transactions, invoices, bills, checks, uh, time tracking records, and so forth. Objects. Every, we, we think of everything within the XML as an object. And it, we use these objects to distinguish between the data that you can send and the data that you can receive. So an add or a modify request will require an add or a modify object. And we see that there as the customer mod request contains a customer mod object or aggregate. Query, add, and modify responses will all give you a return object. So if I'm doing anything with a customer, my response will contain customer ret objects. If I'm doing a query, I'll have lots of customer ret objects in the response. If I'm doing a modify or an add, I'll have a single customer ret object in the response. The message structure, structure for QBXML is pretty straightforward. There's that message prologue that we saw earlier, the XML processing instruction, and the XML version that we want to use. With uh, QuickBooks 2002, you need to provide the XML version in a doc type declaration, and you'll see the specific syntax of that in the documentation. And that's for 1.0 and 1.1 requests. QuickBooks 2003 and later support that doc type declaration, but for ease of programming, we created also the processing instruction that you've seen before, the QBXML version equals declaration. Once we have that prologue, we're ready for the message body. There's the basic envelope of QBXML. Every XML document needs to have a single top-level aggregate. That's that QBXML envelope you see there. Within that is the envelope of the message request or the message response. And within that envelope, you have all your requests and all, those will all be top-level aggregates, and they'll all end with RQ, customer query RQ, for example, customer add RQ, invoice add RQ, and so forth. The response is very similar. Instead of a messages RQ, we get a messages RS for response, and we see the Response, the responses within that envelope. And there'll be one response for each request that we sent, and the top level will again end in RS instead of RQ. And within an RS, you'll find the individual RET objects, a customer RET, an invoice RET, and so forth. So here's a simple add request to add a customer, and we're just providing the name, first name, last name, and the billing address for that customer. Very straightforward request, and we're telling QuickBooks that we want to stop when it sees an error. And the response from that, which I've truncated somewhat, is very straightforward. We get that 
QBXML messages RS envelope, and then the customer add response. The request ID, the status code is zero, so everything was successful, and we see the message and the severity of that um, status as well. Then we get the customer ret object, and within it we get the list ID that was assigned by QuickBooks, the time it was created, the time it was uh, modified, the edit sequence, and so forth. That edit sequence name and full name are really important, so let's take a look at them in a little bit more detail. The edit sequence is required to modify any QuickBooks data, and that's to prevent inadvertently overriding QuickBooks data with something stale. So if the user modified the data in QuickBooks, and then you go and try and write over that, you wouldn't want to slam the user's change. So the edit sequence changes any time the object itself changes. So if your edit sequence is out of date, you have to refresh from QuickBooks, do a query to get back the latest edit sequence, and you can also do the quick comparison to make sure that you have the latest data. Then the name versus the full name. This is a common source of confusion. The name field contains the actual name of a particular item in a list. The, the customer's name, Peter Vogel, for example, or, or family room in this example. The full name includes the parent names, and it's like a path in the file system. So for example, here we have the, full na the name family room actually is a job for Christy Ambercrombie, the customer. So let's look at how QBXML and QBFC relate to each other. First, it helps to understand how those QBXML components map to QBFC. Well, basically everything in QBXML maps to an object in QBFC. And the COM object, that top-level COM object that you're going to use to communicate with QuickBooks, that you're going to use a new function to create, is a request processor if you're talking QBXML, and it's a session manager if you're talking QBFC. And unique to QBFC is the concept of a list and an OR list object. And these represent the XML's ability to have more than one item with the same tag name in them, or items with two different tag names that are mutually exclusive. To build a message, we've already seen in the example declaring and instantiating the session manager, creating that request message set, and uh, then setting it up. So we first need to look at how to set the message set attributes. QBFC will default them for us, but it's useful to see how to set them. So the, there's an attributes property on that request message set, and it is in self an object with properties for each attribute that you can set. So for example, the message request set has an on error, a new message set ID, and an old message set ID. The, the new message set and the old message set ID are used for error recovery. So with the request message set dot attributes, so I'm just taking advantage of Visual Basic a little bit here rather than assigning that attributes object or retyping it over and over again. I set the on error to ROE stop, so I want it to stop on error. I set the new message set ID to some string and the old message set ID to zero. Just a very simple, straightforward way to set the individual attributes on that. Then I'm ready to build my messages. And for every object that I, any request I'm going to send, I need to append that request to the overall message set. There are separate object types for each request, and there's an append method for each of those object types. So for example, if I want to add an invoice, I create that invoice add object, and I call the request message set to add an invoice, uh, append an invoice add request to the overall message set. Then there are objects within the requests to handle each individual element. They're associated with the values you're going to send. They're standard types, I, Q, B, string, and so forth. And there are methods there to access the values and set the values, clear the values, and so forth. So there's set value, set the value as a string, set it empty, unset it, and so forth. Very straightforward. I can also check whether the value is empty or not. And finally, I can ask QBFC to tell me 
what the maximum length of an element is uh, as declared in the XML specification. So here, as a simple example, I need to set the reference number for an invoice that I'm going to add. So I take that invoice add object, I grab its ref number object, and set the value 0013672. There are aggregate objects, and those can contain other aggregate objects, attribute objects, element objects, list objects, and or list objects, just like we saw with the request message set object. So for example, here's the shipping address in an invoice add. So I want to set its adder 1, adder 2, adder 3, city, state, and postal code. Very straightforward, I reference each of those sub-elements.